I had so much fun getting to know our guest today, Carrie Lake, and you can too. To start with, check out her website, generateharmony.com, and you'll be greeted with phrases like this. Being human differently. Or interspecies consciousness and human evolution. Ask Carrie what she does, and she might say something like this. I help show people more about what they already know about themselves. Or maybe, I listen in a way that people can hear themselves. Carrie Lake's best known for her work as an animal communicator, but she now focuses her energy on teaching others how to communicate more effectively with both people and animals. You can read or listen to her book, Listen Like a Horse, Relationships Without Dominance, and find it online. And you can join us today for a talk I've called A Deep Dive into the waters of resilience, connection, and communication with Carrie Lake, where we'll discuss a foundational awareness game, the difference between discernment and judgment, a story of how she found peace and light in a cold, dark place, and how Judgy McJudgy Pants and her friend, the mayor of Thinky Town, can't be left to run the show page. And she'll share a simple process for calming the mind and a simple constructive way to talk to ourselves. Enjoy! If you're an adult amateur horse lover who wonders what it takes to make magic with horses, you're in the right place. I'm Paige Lockton, and this is The Magic of Horsecraft. Join me for conversations with wizards in the world of horsecraft about the ingredients needed to build connection with horses, and courage in life. Turns out these things are connected. How do I know? (laughs) Like most things, I learned the hard way. I lost the magic I once had with horses. In regaining it, I discovered that the elements of connection are learnable. Whether you ride your horses forwards, backwards, or sideways, stick around for stories that show us how we are the same and that anything is possible. Take a chance. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about how I came across Carrie and how it jives with my journey and sort of the soup that I'm sitting at as I evolve <laughs> and and questions I put to Carrie. So um, thankful to Warwick Schiller's podcast. Um, he's brought a lot of amazing voices to the world and yours was one of them, Carrie. So I um, heard you there and then found you in common. I kept seeing um, that beautiful picture of you and your amazing smile <laughs> on their friends list. And I, I friended you and started down the Carrie Lake rabbit hole following up your website, which is really um, unique and beautiful and soft where the world can be so pushy and salesy and it um gives a tremendous a feel of who you are and I saw that you were offering um a gathering a monthly gathering and I joined in and um really appreciated the discussions on so many levels and immediately wanted to share and ask more questions (laughs) Um, and, uh, I did right away, I bombarded Carrie with, (laughs) um, with voice bombs, I call them. (laughs) So thoughts out loud into a microphone to be listened to at your convenience, you know, left at mine to be listened to at yours and responded to or not responded to in any way that sees fit. That's how I consider the voice bomb. And, um, I got a voice bomb or two in and realized that I wanted to save it and not kind of recreate it again and stage it for the podcast because it was that that I wanted to capture these organic responses um, that Carrie had. So um, I I put a pin in it and quit bombarding Carrie with voice voice bombs uh, for us to unpack the intersection of resilience and change and horses. 
um, changing how we are being in the world and perceiving horses and some of the vulnerability around that. Um, so my own vulnerability is that um, I come from a line of rock and sock and cowboys, <laughs> descendant of one of the toughest, gutsiest cowboys in the West in really hard times. And then I was brought up under the tutelage of colonels and captains that were cavalry officers in a sport that tested horses and riders to their absolute deaths because in times of war you needed to. And as the vet's kid, I knew how to step into an emergency and immobilize a horse to take care of it. But those approaches um, didn't always translate well to the audience I was teaching who couldn't step into a situation at six foot one with all of the assuredness that I did and immobilize a horse, nor should they, right? So things didn't always transpose. And um, although I did seem to have an innate ability to soothe animals, I lost it and my ability to athletically move with them and, and run and jump with them as a three-day event rider, I lost that through stress, bad living and cancer. And those things go hand in hand. So yeah. since coming back, I've been exploring um, what does it take to live in congruence with oneself, to let go of our programming, um, you know, part of the, not only the descendants of the roughest, toughest cowboys in the military, but then to be the people pleaser <laughs> in the mix and to arrive here and be really vulnerable about wanting to change and adapt how I relate to the world. And we talk about this through the metaphor and the reality of horses, of course. Um, I see other people doing it more gently <laughs> I see other people doing it um who invite the horse instead of show them who's boss leadership take charge and it's working for them so I have adopted a lot of these things I've taken um a Mustang Maddie course on liberty training or clicker training rather and how they think and how they learn and I'm a adopting these things but I still find that then I am in the middle of giving the horse choice the horse says no the horse needs to be able to do these things <laughs> hmm how do we accomplish um that the horse has a safe and meaningful life in a pressure and release world um and that they learn how to be a ridden horse if that's going to be their jobs in a way that gives them fulfillment and safety and their rider safety. How do we make sure they get the exercise they need to get if they're allowed to say no? And so um, I was bombarding Carrie about a few things and I'm going to finally throw over the ball. I mean, hogged the mic for a bit on the intro. Um, the last message um that i that i sent to her was kind of giving her a lot of this backstory and you know here i am and i'm trying some hard caring and sometimes i feel lost and sometimes it's hard to do in a world where it isn't the norm so if you come from um a line of scientists and um, atheists and there's an arrogance about the accepted ways and you've been a people pleaser, oh, <laughs> living then in line with your new beliefs can be difficult. Um, I wondered how Carrie managed, because as I have heard, Carrie grew up always seeing the world differently than most of the people around her, <laughs> until she found her tribe. Um, how do we show up and be resilient and embrace this change? And um 
get over kind of this stage into it being the fully embodied uh, sure. place that we want to go. <laughs> uh, well, first, thank you. Thank you for sharing your backstory. And um, I hope you never discount your own resilience, your own capacity to be flexible and your own innate um, compass that's pointing you toward this knowing that there is something else. Mm -hmm. Like this is what's happening, but um, there's another way. Even if I can't see it, even if I don't know it, even if nobody believes me, that right there, I think awareness of that compass that says, hmm, there's got to be another option. That to me, that tiny seems tiny, but it's this universal multidimensional awareness um, that might just be the foundation of resilience, always knowing like there's more and I'll have that, right? And I mean, if I'm going to break it down to something simple, that that seems to me like a good place to start. But um, what I'll share with you is just literally immediately before hopping on this call, I was bawling my eyes out because um, I don't know if if you guys are all aware of a movement happening to use AI to create two way communication with animals. And it's founded in decades of data that's been collected on cetacean vocalizations and um, bat vocalizations and birds and monkeys and um, cats. I mean, you can get a little AI collar that translates your cat, your cat's meows for you. Um, in, in and among that community doing that work, I uh, a friend of mine told me about it. And I, of course, went and inserted myself <laughs> into the conversation um, to, to see what was going on. How are they thinking? How are they building this? How is science approaching the idea of actual two-way communication with animals? And who's doing this research? Where is their heart? How well do they know themselves? And so I've been just sort of surfing alongside with a, a community with the Earth Species Project um, for several months. And <clears throat> I got an email this morning um, announcing a grand prize award for a scientist for you know, people to compete and scientists to present their work um, to use AI to move us toward true two-way two communication and the ability to listen to how the animals would guide life on the planet so that we might be able to do better for the planet. It's, it is, I know there are heartful people in and among that world. And I know that there is a heart behind this desire to communicate using technology. Um, but it made my stomach turn to see the announcement for a, a monetary prize for technology. And it's the turning in my stomach wasn't about that humans are um, dishonoring the animals or you know, AI is bad. It's nothing like that. What was hard for me was the feeling that people in an opportunity to truly communicate with non-human life seem still very willing to give their power away to external technology rather than looking to what is already innate. And it made my stomach go inside out and sideways. So I, I have connection with people in, in one of the ESP communities and um, reached out to him to say, oh, I feel like I need to speak truth to power right now and remind people that our innate evolution, we, we would be so well served to honor the evolution of, of an awareness of our innate systems alongside our externalized technological systems. And I don't hear 
these people putting out grand projects speaking to that and it's cr frankly driving me crazy right now so um immediately before the call i got a beautiful response from the person i had spoken to and and the opportunity that it gave me his his response was incredibly kind and heartful and thoughtful um and understanding and reassuring because he's he has access to people that i don't and reassuring that there are sensitive people at the forefront of these conversations. And at the same time, there is a technology machine that nobody's going to stop, right? Uh, and so we can just accept that and, and start getting curious what else is here, what else is here. Mm -hmm. And his kind response to me helped me go to that question, what else is here? What else is here? And notice in myself this opportunity to heal a hurt of feeling my whole life completely misunderstood completely ignored expected to fit into somebody else's system that was very squeezy and small for me but i was not going to receive any recognition or any um, assistance if i was not visible to that system and so this little dance that we went through this morning and tears and tears, like shaking tears, became a beautiful opportunity for me to address my own hurt, to realize that growing up when those hurts were put into place, the people around me did not have the skills to honor the sensitivity. They did not have the awareness and even if they had an intuitive knowing of it, they didn't have the capacity to honor what they knew intuitively and turn it into something that would have supported me in my the emergence of my uniqueness. Now, you know, of course, it's how many decades has it been for me to develop the awareness of this moment? You know, it's been this many. It's, it's like today, day, I'm today days old when I realize this, right? And and so um, the tears this morning just opened up so much more space for the compassion. And that is a vulnerability, but I, I, it seems to me only a vulnerability to myself. A am I at a place where I can be kind enough to myself that when something's hard, I can turn my heart toward my mind my psyche and say, yes, this is hard and I've got you. In those tears, that that was what I was I offered myself. Yeah, this is really hard. And yeah, you're doing great. This is where we are right now. You're doing great. And look, everything's generally going in the right direction. And you are a part of it. And you've been a part of it. Your heart is definitely a part of it. Just by acknowledging your own heart, Carrie, you ripple out into the universe of people who are interested in living a more gentle world, in a more gentle world with one another. And all of that comes from, especially in the, the deep, intense moments, from remembering that I could leave space for something else. Like, yeah, this is happening. This is intense, but I prefer it gentle. So show me something new. And in that, we actually begin creating something new. I heard uh, so many threads within that that I would love to follow up on. The first one that struck me, well, I was geeking out about the AI technology, <laughs> was <laughs> that you were... It, it drives you crazy because we can all do this. And I think that is something worth saying. What I hear you say is, Paige, I'm not the only one that can do this. Everyone can learn if they try, pay attention, are guided. Is that right? What I would say is the, um, the technology and the capacity to do this, it comes factory installed. So what we're learning it's not like we're, I don't think the, the, the most efficient approach is to go out and learn it as if you don't know it. To me, 
the most efficient approach is get curious where it's already functioning and then relax and watch it expand. Mm -hmm. Don't try to define it. Don't try and teach it to a machine at least for 10 seconds. Give yourself 10 luxurious seconds to actually experience your own system alive and well and working and then go do something else with it, right? But yeah. if we try and teach each other as if it doesn't already exist, then you're shoving that, that part of ourselves, that capacity back into a box that says, no, no, not me. I'm not divine. I'm not part of the whole. I have to learn that. And I'll believe it when somebody, you know, uh, proves to me that I've done enough. I've worked hard enough. I have proven enough. And then I'll say, okay, what's next, right? It, it's the way we've been taught to be educated. And so really my suggestion is that's great. Let's not deny how we've been taught to learn. Let's just open a little bit of extra space and say, well, there's all this information too. How can we let them be side by side? How do we watch the way they're meant to complement each other? Like if, you know, if the intellect and the and intuition were riding a tandem bike, the journey is going to be very different depending on who has the handlebars. Yes. Right? And the advice is going to be different depending who's sitting in the back. Yeah. And so, but we've got to, you know, the more we go, we've got to listen to me, whatever. It's going to go how it goes. But the more we open space to consider that intellectual awareness, learning, and information is absolutely necessary and vital and beautiful. And then intuitive information and knowledge and, and learning is also equally beautiful and relevant and necessary. It doesn't have to be a competition anymore of which one is correct which one is right, What? which one can I trust? They operate differently. And if you try to make intuitive information operate the way intellectual information does, it's not gonna work. It, it's like trying to you know, run Microsoft systems on a Mac OS platform. It doesn't work, right? Or if at best it's clunky. Right. And so, you know, this is this is what's important to me is leaving some space to be curious and to relax the stranglehold of domination on on intellectual achievements up on a pedestal because it's not how nature works. Mm -hmm. um, I can see the sadness in that if we rely solely on AI to tell us what our horse is thinking, we'll never, we may never feel anything between our horse and, and that is the magic. That's exactly. why we, we do this. Yes. Um, and that would be absolutely tragic. And we look outside of ourselves, um, you know, to, to psychics and to communicators all the time for something that we could develop within us. And um, I think maybe some of us don't know that we could, um, we need to know that that is, has been other people's reality. Yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely. um, I find some of the science, a nice gateway in for, um, for my experience. Um, for instance, the heart math tools quantified and made measurable the, importance of grounding yourself and being present and its effect on horses um yeah. so the heart heart math has a tool that and i say it measures your zen right totally. um, and uh so i was able to kind of hold it up and go see it's real <laughs> to people who <laughs> rolled their eyes and maybe i don't need to try to convert um the world uh, and argue my 
my reality with it, but it was my gateway in and uh, maybe it will be for someone else too. I, I'm absolutely certain. And again, the science absolutely serves. I, it, I mean, it, one of its greatest services is to help the mind find enough validity to open some space, mm. right? And then get curious. Okay, so what else is in that space? When the head has, so this is what I love about working with the intellect. Oftentimes it, it's like peppering us with questions. Why this and why not that? And how come this and prove that? Well, instead of telling the mind, shut up, be quiet, you're irrelevant, you're bothering me. What if we start answering the questions? right? If the mind says, well, why does this work? And we turn, even if I don't have the answer, I can turn to the mind and say, you know what, that is a really good question. Let's go find out. Mm -hmm. And then watch the mind quiet itself right down when it's no longer, um, you know, trying desperately to help and being poo-pooed as if it's, you know, a toddler trying to help us make pancakes and ending up with batter on the walls, right? It, when we turn and we really acknowledge, you know what, buddy, I know you're trying to help. Thanks. I don't know how it's going to help yet, but let's keep going and we'll give it a try. That right there is starting to cultivate a relationship within myself that honors the intellect, that honors the tools that satisfy the intellect, which could be mathematics, science, engineering, right? Things that are tangible, measurable, brilliant, perfect. But what I love, even in, in the example of heart math, the heart math tools made it possible for me to feel grounded. It leads to feeling. Mm -hmm. It does. Life is felt. Mm -hmm. And because feeling really, it can be, conceptualized, metaphorized, but not calculated and, and measured. And so, you know, the things that help the mind get closer to recognizing, feel, subtle energy, subtle communication, that in, in different shades and flavors, that is how we help each other, how we help ourselves and each other start to have a relationship with non-linear, non-measurable, felt ways of relating to life. And I think for a lot of people, it's very much like learning a new language. Like intuition is something like gut feel, you know, different people relate to it on different levels. And um, some people just say, oh yeah, I got a, I got a gut feeling about that. Or they'll call it mother's intuition because mothers just know. Or they'll, you know, your dog looks at you and you know that they have to go outside and somehow that's different from, I want some food, right? We all have an interaction with that intuitive level of ourselves. And this is why to me, the more, whether it's through heart math, whether it's through meditation, Qigong, um, exercise, I don't know, jump out of an airplane if that's what works for you, you know? The, however, we are already relating to that sense. The more you take your awareness to where it is already functioning and you watch the feeling in your body when you know, hmm, that's a gut feeling. Oh, feeling, that implies the body. I'm gonna take my awareness to where I felt that and then relax and just be aware, get more aware of the feeling of it. Mm -hmm. Our innate systems are designed so that where you put your awareness, you create expansion in consciousness. And I, I think physics does have a way to explain that mathematically these days, but it has to do with like quantum vacuum fluctuations and things like that. So I don't know if everybody wants the language around that. But um, science does have a way now to start to illustrate that your awareness amplifies mm. wherever you put it. 
and in that way, in a very simple way, where where your intuition is already serving you, then mm -hmm. put your awareness there where you feel it and relax and and watch it start to get a little bit more clear each time you notice it. Mm -hmm. I think um, for um, those of us who have gone through extended periods of uh, discomfort, and that could be in emotional or physical, sometimes we disconnect from our bodies. And then, um, it, then there is like, I, I don't know what I'm feeling. I can't access that. And um, so my own route back in through that, and I think it's common in most, in so many practices is through the breath, mm. back in through the breath to get mm -hmm. to the body. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to access our instincts. Absolutely. What, well, one thing I want to say is um, what an amazing uh, benevolence it is when we are in that kind of distress that we have the mechanism to disconnect for a bit, right? The numbness, it just buffers us from a, a kind of constant, stimulating torture hmm. of emotional physical pain right and i wonder if we if and when we've been through that and we're on the other side of it can we extend some genuine appreciation for the system that that buffered me like yeah i went through stuff i went through a lot of stuff but you know what? I was really protected. And now that means I get to bring parts of myself back to life. But wow, I'm, I'm still here, which is very different than um, a lot of people that I get to talk to. Are, they move through a, a sense of despair that, that they went into numbness. And now they have to bring themselves out. And it's hard. And there's a lot of feels to feel. And there, there is often built a, a sense of conflict around where they're at on their journey now. And I, I get it. <laughs> um, but I wonder if, if we might just continue to sprinkle the opportunity um, for appreciation that our systems work in such a way that can protect us. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I have a very dear friend who was um, housing a family member of hers who was on a journey with heroin and, and probably just, I don't know, just heroin or different drugs. Um, and his parents said, no, we don't want anything to do with him. Um, he was kind of banished. So my friend said, yes, you're welcome here. We'll do what we can to help you. And he lived there with them for about four months. Um, she was going to therapy appointments with him you know supporting him in any way possible and then there there was a day where they were standing together in the office and he was talking and they were they had just come back from therapy and all of a sudden um her eyes got wide and she collapsed in a heart attack and just fully out um, her partner was there. He thought she was gone. Her eyes were dilated. Her mouth was hanging open. He was doing CPR. And um, yeah, so that whole thing happened. They called the ambulance. She went to the hospital and um, has recovered quite beautifully after all of that. But it takes a little bit of um, negotiation with yourself to on the other side of it. Why did that happen? What did I do? You know, I can't believe I was, I was out, I was gone, you know, I was dead for four minutes. And um, when, when she and I talked about it, really, I, it kind of brought me to tears that her systems were so kind and so benevolent that basically they just, she got to leave the room while her body went through a massive reset trying to get everyone's attention that her heart could not handle what she was trying to do. Mm. Yeah. Her system let her leave the room. <laughs> yeah. You know? And not have to go through 
the intensity and the the torturous feelings you know of of pain and um fear mm -hmm. and it's just an uncommon perspective because it's really easy to say heart attacks are bad and the situation is bad and what i've gone through is bad but even through all of my own journeys in life yeah in in the moment i'm not saying it's fun I'm not saying I would choose to do it again. Like, thank goodness, I, you know, we have the opportunity to learn and not repeat these things, right? But um, when I look back and take any judgment out of the experience itself and just go, whoa, look at how that was orchestrated, right? And then on the other side, yeah, there might be some scar tissue, yeah, there, there might be some numbness there. There might be like, you know, my heart's been asleep and now there's, you know, prickles, pins and needles as it comes back to life. Mm -hmm. But wow, look at it coming back to life. Right. Um, and so for, for people who either had to shut themselves down, which I, I did as well. I don't know. I don't know if it's in the stories enough, but for about five years, I was in a really abusive relationship and um, basically smoked weed 24 seven just to be able to, you know, endure mm -hmm. this responsibility that I had assigned myself called a marriage relationship. Right. And um, so, yeah, there was quite a bit of numbness. It was scary and it was hard. And coming out of it, knowing how sensitive I am, knowing who I've been since I was an infant, there was absolutely a period of time where I couldn't feel and I couldn't relate. And I forgot how to be honest. I forgot what honest feels like because I spent so much time lying to myself that mm -hmm. this was what I wanted and I was doing the right thing, right? So it's that's a real thing, breathing life back into the parts that went numb just to help us continue forward mm -hmm. until the moment we had enough courage, strength, and willingness to reclaim our freedom and create in a new way. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to take a moment to speak to what's behind the system that uh, benevolently puts us in a state of shutdown. So um, I think it's just important to know when we look at our nervous system, we talk a lot about fight and flight. Um, but that beyond that, if flight isn't a possibility and fight isn't a possibility, our bodies will choose the most likely state to the least damage and put us into freeze or even fawn mode. And the first time I understood this, as a nervous system adaptation to threat developed over centuries <laughs> and then looked back on some of my history of people pleasing and fawning and doing things that were against what I felt internally I should I didn't hate myself anymore oh that's so <laughs> because, beautiful I could go, oh, okay, well, that was a nervous system response, and it kept me safe. So in many situations, you know, befriending your captor is the best thing you can do. Yes. Not necessarily intellectually, but your body is going to put you into that mode in a nervous system state. So not feeling your body, not is a nervous system adaptation to threat. And I think it can maybe help some people look back on their past with empathy for past self instead mm. of, oh my God, it's so cringy. Right? No, awful to look back on yourself and feel cringy. Mm. Oh my, well, I mean, you know, yes, it is. And it's, it's a learned response to go first to a, a suggestion that it, it should have been different than that. Mm. Right. Um, and I want I wanted to speak to Right there, you spoke about going back and having empathy for your past self. And I would love to explore um, empathy and compassion. Because in my 
travels, they're different things. It's a different consciousness. It's a different feeling. And a lot of people, I see, I, I hear people use the word empathy when I feel like they're talking about compassion. The feeling that they're, that they're sharing energetically is compassion, but then they'll use the word empathy or empathetic. Mm-hmm. And um, this is something that I would love to just illuminate and, and sprinkle space for clarity mm-hmm. because um, they're different. They're two different things, right? And so when I was listening to you, looking back and, you know, being able to see the part of yourself that was just having a nervous system reaction to what was perceived as a survival moment. And so I go in th- into the habit of people pleasing. Like, <laughs> I've never done that. Only other people have done that, not me, right? But If we offer that part of ourselves compassion, what we're saying is, well, of course you did that. Well, of course, you know what? You don't need to be any different than you are. It makes, you are fine with me, right? And that to me is also love. Empathy is going in and saying, oh, there's that feeling. I can feel that feeling. That's that feeling. I can feel that feeling. That's the feeling. I can feel that feeling. And so when people say, I want to empathize, then they might not be realizing that they're saying, what's that feeling? I can feel that feeling. What's that feeling? I can feel that feeling. If instead we actually tune ourselves to what compassion is and compassion is, I'm, I'm sorry that's happening to you. I'm here to assist any way that I can, but you're doing perfect. And I have every confidence you've got this, but I'm happy to help if you'd like, Mm. right? That's love. And to, to have a cognitive awareness of the difference based in the fact that they feel different. We can define them differently. We can cognitize them differently and we can feel them differently. It lets me move in the world um, with a lot less effort, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for pointing out the difference. What does that feel like to you? Um, I was thinking back on how often I I say one word and mean the other. So I was kind of going through my head of, yeah, in the conversation, I said, oh, I empathize with my past self, but it was yeah, I have compassion for my past self. And then I, I think that's um, with without that, it's hard to be truly resilient because we're always kind of brittle inside, aren't we? We're protecting ourselves and we're judging ourselves. And so uh, there are a couple of words that I keep hearing and com- coming back to. And I heard them in your book. Um, uh, for those of you that are listening, Carrie, wrote a book and she also reads it on audio. I listened to it on audio called Listen Like a Horse. And um, oh, now I've jumped tangents and I'm having a hard time finding my way back to my tangent of um, what we need to be resilient. Oh, the word judgment came up all the time and being non-judgmental and how important that was because we can't you know, love is the absence of judgment. And um, yeah, I want to kind of bring you into that. If you can speak a bit to the idea of where judgment gets us in trouble, whether it's with horse training or ourselves and non-judgment and and horses and how these things relate to self-compassion and resilience. Amazing, amazing. So I, I'll start with um, the difference, like looking, looking at the relationship between judgment and discernment. A lot of people will say, yeah, Carrie, but you need judgment to, you know, decide not to walk in front of the bus. You need, ju- you need to be using good judgment to not go home with the stranger and stuff, stuff like that. So I kind of want to highlight the, the relationship and the difference between judgment and discernment. The first place I go to, to get to know each of them is how they feel. 
Okay. So, you know, if I say, oh, Paige, you, you know what? The blue shirt is not good. You really should have worn the red shirt today. And you watch how your body responds to that. How, what, okay. The, and the feeling that comes with that. Just notice, let's not call it good or bad. Just notice that feeling. And then, you know, like you're trying on a t-shirt. That's the judgment t-shirt, right? Then you take that t-shirt off and you try on the discernment t-shirt, which would sound something more like, okay, that's the blue shirt. If we had worn the red shirt, you would have complimented the scarves hanging behind you over there and perhaps the stove would pop. Okay. Yeah. So just notice what that feels like yeah. in your cells. Don't call it good or bad. Just notice what the feeling is like. I noticed smiling. I noticed your body moved. I noticed, you know, you, your head kind of moved around and relaxed. In, with the judgment t-shirt, I noticed you got very still. Mm. Your face got harder. There was nothing in return. There was um, a, a, a solidness. And a, like a, you can't move me in your body. Yeah. Interesting. Whoa, you're good at that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I felt all those things. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what if one's not better than the other? They simply produce a different experience. Yes. And you get to have a say in what you'd like to experience in your world. You always have the opportunity to experience stillness, resistance, st solidness, or you are always also equally um, invited to experience smiling and fluidity and movement and bouncing and, and playfulness, right? <laughs> Yay for yoga balls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, it's not one or the other. They both exist and we're going to encounter both. To me, I would say, you know, judgment because it um, puts a flag in the sand and creates a stoppage of movement that says, I have decided this is what it is and I'm going to defend it. It creates less movement, uh, fewer opportunities. Discernment is, it opens doors. It offers options. It creates space for things to move in any direction you put your awareness. Okay, so judgment limits movement, discernment offers movement. So this is the, the, the way that I play with those two ideas. So now let's take this into relationship with a horse, right? So here I am, and I've got this horse that I just rescued out of a, a situation. And I bring them to my place where they have a pasture and all the good food and all the supplements. And, you know, we, we got natural food natural teeth floating done, no power tools because power tools lead to long-term issues. And we did all the things right and we're feeling great. And then one day we go out with a halter and we just want to brush our, our new horse and our horse pins his ears and walks away. And we've been studying voice and choice right? And we've been studying how to let the horse uh, be part of the conversation. And so we notice the horse walking away and we go, okay, the horse is saying no. And then on the inside, I'm like, oh, dang it. I've done everything. I've done everything right. And the horse still, oh, I have to let it be okay. I have to let it be okay but I did everything right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which t-shirt am I wearing in that moment? Oh yeah. That's the blue judgment one. <laughs> that's the judgment t-shirt. Okay. But it's an option. Yeah. It's an option because for, for a lot of people that 
tension of, oh, I thought I did everything right, that could still be motivation for them to try again. Okay. So we're not going to judge judgment. We're just going to see it for what it is. It is just one way of relating to the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at the same situation, but with the discernment t-shirt on, which is more like the feeling. So go back to when we just tried, tried on the discernment t-shirt for you, right? And put that t-shirt back on so you can feel the smile, the ease, the bounce. And when you're wearing that t-shirt and you look at the same situation, what might go through your mind when the horse turns and walks away? I would get curious and wonder why, as opposed to judging it as bad. Okay. And then what could that curiosity lead to just from your experience? Um, asking myself questions um so you know does he not want to work does he just want to go eat why doesn't he want to you know should he have an easy day i would kind of start asking questions i guess okay beautiful beautiful and i mean it can lead to all sorts of questions as well like you know what if i join him hmm. What if I follow? What if I walk with him? What if I listen differently? What if I just celebrate that he felt okay saying, I'm going this way? What if I don't even decide he's saying no? What if I don't even interpret it? What if I just, like you said, get curious and say, ah, I wonder what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then maybe what that can do is bring my awareness back to my own experience, to my own body. Because when my awareness is with my own body, everything tends to relax. Mm. And in that relaxation, oh, what do you know? The pony's turning around mm -hmm. and heading back this way. Yeah. I'm curious. Yes. So I'll tell you another story. Mm. Um, I was doing a, a three and a half day event up in Northern California. And one of the people I was working with um, also is a trainer and a coach. And she brought her big sorrel gelding and um, just had him loose in the arena when I stepped into the arena to work with her. And that, you know, there was the two of us in the arena and there were people standing and watching and the horse is down at, way at the other end of the uh, this really big arena and her complaint was I can't catch my horse and it it sucks because I'm a trainer I'm supposed to be able to do all of this and I'm I feel like a failure and I'm a this and I'm a this and I'm a that and so I just stood next to her and I listened to her for a bit and I just just acknowledged and said uh-huh and so what else and basically just told her yeah okay good listened good and listened and she talked about, and I said, okay, so what are you good at, right? What does work for you? Because there are definitely times when you have caught your horse, like case in point, he's here, right? So what does work for you? And so she started talking about, well, when I go in and I'm feeling like this, he doesn't walk away. When I'm doing this, he shows up. And she started talking about what does work. And, um, and it was hysterical because her horse the whole time had been walking toward her while she was talking about everything that does work for her. Mm -hmm. And it was total divine orchestration. She ended up saying, yeah, but I still, I still am not confident I'm ever going to be able to catch this horse reliably. He's literally standing right behind her, breathing on her. And she didn't see it. Everyone else was laughing. And she's like, okay, okay. And at that point, I hope I did this, pointing her awareness to what her body feels like when she's talking about what does work. It creates a different state of your nervous system. It is what heart math is all about, creating a state in your nervous system. They call it coherence. Great word. 
You could also call it the absence of conflict. Even if I'm judgmental, can I just have no conflict with the fact that I'm judgmental? And all of a sudden you create a lot of space, mm -hmm. right? Because we all judge, we've all got judgment. So can we just call it out and not be in a fight with it? Because only then will I start to recognize whether I still, whether that's still serving me. Do I still want to be, you know, on the judgment train and wear the judgment t-shirt? I wonder if there's another option, right? Better fit. Yeah. I really um, appreciated in um, the story you wrote in your book about Cooper that I think that was the gift you brought to him. You didn't judge his behaviors as bad. You just right. said, this is him communicating with his environment <laughs> and yes. the style of communication. And um, you saw a playful force that wanted to, oops, I'm throwing things, wanted to engage. <laughs> <laughs> part of the course <laughs> um yeah so coming in and coming in with non-judgment and a sense of fun I think yeah um I know with is a mare in the barn I'm doing liberty work with and she's been one person's horse her whole life and then her world changed um as she came here to become a horse for a couple of little girls and a family and um so it took it's still taking her a long time um, to trust some things, particularly because she wasn't ever housed in a barn. And so being inside of a barn, which they're in very, very little, they essentially live out with a run in shed. But mm. being inside there is really vulnerable for her. And um, if I come at her with intent, like into the barn, I'm training you today and I have these things that I'm gonna practice She's just gone. She's like a radar. <laughs> so just, I repel her an equal distance from me. I'm like, oh. And then as soon as I change my attention, maybe to flicker or someone else or just recognize what I'm bringing to it, then she comes right back to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, See, what I love about that, she's just going, whoa, this is what that feels like. Yeah. She's not saying you, you human, you're doing it wrong. And you're, you're too think. No, she's going, whoa. And she's just being honest. This is what I love about mares. Like they are honest. Yeah. When people say she's so marish and, and bitchy and all these things like, no, she's actually just being honest about what her world is about. And the more we learn how to go, whoa, I can see that. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. That's when she's going to turn and go, whoa, you heard me. Yeah. Well, now I'm curious about you. Yeah. yeah. Curiosity, man, is it's the key to dopamine. It's the key to really shifting from sympathetic to parasympathetic. It is the key to intuitive clarity. Intuition thrives in curiosity, mm -hmm. right? When we learn how to ask questions that are not yes, no questions. When we learn how to ask questions that or even ponder with things that start with i wonder mm -hmm. i wonder what that i wonder what she's saying i wonder what that feels like mm -hmm. i wonder i wonder what's actually true for her when i show up with a big fat agenda mm -hmm. you know with cooper i i wonder if he actually is mean or if there's something else going on here right and that that's what opened the space for me to feel like he he's just like well all I ever wanted to do was play and people, people are rough. So I figure they want to play rough. I can play rough. Let's play rough. Mm -hmm. Right. There is no malice in any of it. It's just the people around didn't have the capacity to become aware of the aggression in their own actions. Yeah. Yeah. That's, this comes back to awareness. We just often aren't aware of what we're causing and then we hire someone to solve that horse's behavior <laughs> yep. it's just an expression of you always said this so well in your book that 
essentially maybe you can say it now they're just expressing themselves it's not a behavior it's yes I mean we call it a behavior I mean that's a human conceptualization of what we observe because that's how we work we're very thinky you know and the mayor of thinky town likes all the files to be set um but when people are learning or expanding their capacity to listen on these levels and to not project so much into the horses. Um, what one of the places that that you could start is just get curious and wonder what what you how you might assess the situation if you receive your horse as saying, "Here's how it feels to be me." Like whatever you notice, they swish their tail. They're saying, "Yep, this is how it feels right now." They move their feet. This is what it feels right now. Mm -hmm. They pin their ears. This is what it feels right now. Now you keep your own self safe. You're not going to go put yourself in a dangerous situation. But if you want to start observing from a different place and at, at a different level, this is a, a foundational awareness game that we can play that what if I just let everything be an expression of how it feels to be them? All they're saying, all they're doing is being honest. This is me right now. Even a shut down horse, even a horse who stands there, unmoving, interacting maybe only by moving their eyes because they've never really had an experience that anything more than that is worth their energy, right? That's a horse saying, here's how it feels to be me right now. Mm -hmm. Now, let's translate this into human terms for a second. Say you're having a hard day and you ask your friend to come and meet you at, and have a tea. And you're sitting across the table from your friend having tea. And how interested are you in having your friend push you and make you move your body to make you be better when all you really want to do is have them listen to how you actually feel. And then what is it like when you have a friend who doesn't try to change you and they actually, you get to say how you actually feel and they listen in a way that you can feel yourself. Mm -hmm. You can hear yourself, right? When we go in with this orientation and we just let the horse be honest we just see them as an honest being genuinely sharing exactly what their world is like in every moment i wonder what that can open up for them to feel safe and comfortable giving back to us mm -hmm. we can have that orientation even if we have an agenda hey buddy we we really do need to get your feet taken care of today but I'm still going to listen to him. Like he's saying, this is how it feels. I'm going to go, yeah, I totally get that's how it feels. And I am going to ask you to lift your foot because we got to take care of your feet. But look at the space that creates for him to lift his foot, which is different than come on horse, just lift your foot. This is fine. You're going to be fine. You've done this a million. Oh, stop being a jerk. Mm, yeah. How often do we hear that? Stop being a jerk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So adopting a, an orientation like this, it's a gift we can offer to a relationship with a partner, regardless of species. I'm going to listen to you as if you're being honest about the way you feel. And I might still need to ask something of you. And I might still have an idea that we could do that would be super fun. But I can approach it from a different orientation that leaves space for actual communication rather than going in with a projection of what I think I want it to be. And I'm going to pretend you have voice and choice, but actually you don't. Mm -hmm. And we all get caught up in that. I, I mean, I can say these things because I've been through it and had to look back and offer myself tremendous compassion for things I would have done differently in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah there um i'm thinking of my cousin's horse who is the thinnest skinned 
of chestnut thoroughbreds ever made you know like the skin is silk there's no hair and just sensitive and um we would say bitchy I went to help her one day and my approach was you know she's got to tolerate that and if she kicks out at you you smack her right you discipline her what well, surprise it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> well you got something out of her with that approach right <laughs> She, um, you know, she was in her stall. So one of the things we changed was anything that happens in their stall, that's just their home. We don't do any treatments or things that they don't like in their stall. Um, if you have to do something like groom and tack up, maybe not do it in there. Um, and just to, to hear her and be like, yeah, you're sensitive. Yeah. What's... <laughs> to hear her would have been a totally different approach and one that we adopted in the end oh wonderful do you get pushback about how to be um how to embody this without getting pushed around like does that mean that every adult amateur horse loving um woman who's going out there to the barn because that's not that we're exclusively a sport of women but it's typical of that they're just going to get walked over now and it's kind of the the feedback I get often is that kind of pushback that yeah. the horses will just be pushy then and you have to smack them you have to make them mind they would bite each other in their own herds and you gotta you know yeah you know, the the response to that will just honestly vary depending on the individual who brings the protest, because, it, you know, a different logic is going to land differently with different people. But in general, my response is, if you go in as a wet noodle, absolutely, <laughs> you're going to get walked on. If you go in there and you don't have any sense of yourself, you go in there and you're not um, prepared to meet the horse where they are. You go in there without the skills and you go in there and you completely abandon all the skills and everything you've ever learned. Yeah, you're probably gonna get walked on. Mm. Um, the survival and defense approach to life will basically by default, negate softness as ineffection ineffectiveness like a hundred percent of the time as an either or right you either do it this way you take charge you dominate or you're gonna get locked on yeah. okay it's an either or no consideration for what else might be there no curiosity for how could i do this differently yeah and self-awareness points at that third option how could i do this differently so in truth, softness is probably the strongest position you could take to your horse. Softness means I can feel myself. I'm aware of myself. My muscles are relaxed. I can move wherever I need to. I'm aware. I can see everything and I intend no harm. That right there describes a space where horses can relax and where everybody becomes a little bit more receptive. It's also a space where I can move faster, easier than if I am stiff and defended and got one fist on the halter because the horse is mouthy and another hand swinging a whip because I'm afraid of the hind end. Mm. That's me bringing the war to the horse, right? So softness around a bitey horse, um, you know, obviously it depends on the situation, but in my experience, offer, being soft among a, around a bitey horse usually looks like I take responsibility for myself and I don't put myself in line of being bitten until we have a little more rapport, mm. until I do have a plan or help. And then I relax my own body so that what I contribute 
to the situation is a space that the horse doesn't need to defend themselves against. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, totally different than coming in like this. You're yeah. not going to bite me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> and Game so, on. <laughs> right? And so with Cooper, who would lead with his mouth, you know, wherever his neck would snake to, he, had, he only really offered to grab my skin once, right? But it was really uncomfortable. And like I wrote about, the energy he brought with it was, ah, it makes your skin crawl. So how do I approach this with softness? I wasn't interested in being a wet noodle. I knew I wasn't there to get walked on. That's my relationship with me. I've got to find some part of myself first. So I have something to contribute to the partnership, right? It's not a motorcycle that, you know, you just flip the switch and it goes and it better behave. That's, it's one of the default unconscious or conscious arrogances of humanity is that that uh, ethnocentrism that um, really would prefer the whole world to organize itself around me. Now, ironically, when we are fully centered in our heart and in connection with our universal selves, that is when the world centers itself around you, but you're coming from a very different place than an ego-driven, fear-driven, uh, control driven mind that says, don't you bite me. Oh no, you don't, you don't. And tries to put myself above another. Yeah. Right. So when I'm done trying to hold myself above and I'm, I'm exploring who I am when I intend no harm, mm. I'm courageous enough to dabble in softness then I create some space for myself to actually use some good tools and use my tools well and have the freedom to step away if I get scared. So with Cooper, that's what I did for a, a long time, for the first month, probably. When he would snake his neck, I would just step out of reach. No punishment, no correction. Just to let him know I'm not available for that. And I intend no harm. I'm right here. And I'd love to scratch your itches. Right. And so softness is the opposite of being walked on. Mm -hmm. It's just unfamiliar to so many people. Um, but it's, it's where horses live when they're not feeling threatened. They live in softness when they're not feeling threatened. Mm. That was um, the word of the month for June was to soften mm. i think at the core of all the best teachings that i had um the instructors would say most often soften 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 and in um, resilience when we were looking at what does it take to be resilient and often you get those like get up be tough God! <laughs> you know, like, uh <laughs> There's a certain amount of grit, I suppose, needed, but to really be resilient, we need to be soft um, and curious and ask questions. And um, the idea that leadership can be soft, that um, one of my mentors, Carmen, says to lead with a soft front and a strong back. Mm -hmm. um, then we are eliciting different responses from our environment when we enter it that way entirely yeah. yeah yeah so beautiful often in this idea this conversation of leadership um you know we'll draw on the the image of a lead mayor or whoever whichever mayor is leading at that moment is the one who is most congruent with herself it's the one who just, this is who I am. And I can feel that this is the way to go. So I'm going. And then everybody can feel that absence of conflict within her or congruence within her. And it feels like a pretty good idea to be absent of conflict. And these are human words describing a feeling, a sensation, not a cognition or a calculation. 
when a mayor just goes, yep, this way, I'm going. Everybody else is like, well, I guess we're going. It's, it's, it's she's magnetic at that point. Yeah. yeah. Everybody harmonizes. And yeah. in that harmony where I can feel you, feeling me, feeling you, we are safe. We have yeah. safety. It doesn't mean some random threat isn't going to show up like a meteor could hit the earth. It's happened before, but we're not def living our lives defended against it. We're living our lives open to the connection where safety can happen. And so in a herd of horses, we, one mare might be like, yep, we're going this way, but maybe a mare back here realizes, whoa, I'm back here and I can see something. Or the stallion comes around and says, ladies, ladies, we need to change direction. And so there's a ripple, like a murmuration through the herd and a mare back here on the other side gets this feeling like, you know what? I got this one. Now I actually were feeling this, let's turn this way. And that becomes the coherence, the congruence. And the whole herd goes, oh, we're turning this way. And it's not that, you know, that, you know, once lead the mayor that was leading a moment ago turns around and, and says, no, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. There's no emotion about it. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. No, they're just, and there might be confusion. There might be a, a point of disharmony before harmony, but everybody is looking and listening to their own nervous systems I would say to the fluctuation of the DNA that the nervous system will amplify and communicate for us as we feel each other through non-physical realms of energy, right? Depending on how fancy you want to get in the language, but it really is about all of our systems giving us the information. Here's how it feels. And when it feels like this, I'm turning left. Oh, look at her. She's going there. I'm going with her. Right. And so this is why, you know, in in that book and in the online stuff that I've created, it's all about helping the mind, the human mind. Find friendship and relevance in felt information. Because the body is only ever being as honest as horses are, our body is only ever being that honest as well. But we have so much, you know, again, the mayor of Thinky Town likes to have control over the whole town. And I, like, you don't get on the train in Thinky Town because it only goes in circles. But, yeah. but when we can help the mayor realize that this undefinable, unrepeatable, uncontrollable information that's like a whole different language is actually relevant and valuable and relatable that then we're talking we're starting to live closer to our hearts we're starting to welcome our intuitive sense to come alive and contribute to the way we think and move and walk in the world mm -hmm. right when we stop making it a competition to be intuitive you know and learn to communicate I mean, if that's how it's going, keep going. I, no, I'm not working so that. well for me, Carrie. That approach is just not working very well for oh, me. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> You're talking right? to a great girl. You got me tagged. <laughs> <laughs> Train so <Yeah>. hard. <laughs> Another option is to every time your mind, you feel, you're going to feel which t shirt your mind puts on when it tries to conquer and go and com compete and achieve. Notice what that t shirt feels like and just say, you know what, there's another option. Let's put on the discernment t shirt for a minute and get curious. Where am I already feeling anything? Mm -hmm. Literally anything. So here's a story about that. I was talking to this one guy who was about a year out of a pretty wicked um, addiction to meth and who knows what else? And um, he he would say he, he doesn't feel, talk about numb, talk about shut down, right? So, all right, well, I'm just going to go to where you can feel something. You got to start somewhere, right? So he was leaning forward and his, he had his like elbows on his knees, right? And I said, okay, so if you look at where your arm is touching 
your knee right there. What do you feel there? And he goes, nothing. I'm like, all right, what does nothing feel like? And he like gets mad and he gets a little concerned and he's like, trying to make sure he feels nothing right <laughs> and, <Yes. he's... laughs> and and so I'm like what does nothing feels like and he goes I am numb and I'm like awesome okay cool what does numb feel like and he tried so hard he's like looking down trying to figure out because the moment we invoked it he started becoming aware of the experience of his own body even mm-hmm. where an arm touches a leg And he looks around and suddenly he's like, oh my God, I can actually feel my arm. I'm like, yeah, let's start there. There you go. Okay. It's not that we don't have these systems. It's that our mind doesn't have a relationship with the information provided by these systems. So when we start with where it already exists, we give the mayor a frame of reference, someplace to begin where the mayor can decide for itself, are we actually safe even if we feel vulnerable? Are we actually going to continue living if I allow an experience of expansion through my heart? Oh, 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 slow down, Carrie. Right? Because it really is only the mayor who's the spokesperson for the ego that's ever concerned with any of these things. So let's befriend that guy or girl and start actually getting curious what information it needs in order to just leave a little space for curiosity. And in in so doing, we very literally recreate a friendship between the mind, the body, and the heart. Mm -hmm. I I love how you talk to your thinking mind and your ego and the the one that's the hamster wheel and the worrier like a friend and like oh I hear you buddy you sound concerned what do you need to know exactly (laughs) would it help if you knew yeah um, if you knew something about heart math would it help if you had some physics would it help if you actually go talk to somebody about this would it help if we sit down and draw out a spreadsheet uh, of all the details. Let's do it. Let's do it. That's love talking. That's what love sounds like. That's what love feels like. At least that's what my world has shown me so far. And I'm, I feel like I'm just getting started. Hmm. Um, Do we have time for, and do you think it's an appropriate time for the story that you told at your gathering um, about the shower? Oh, wow. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I I didn't even remember I told that story. (laughs) Beautiful example of how you spoke to yourself in a situation that would set ourselves off. And I think it relates to any situation we're in. And some of it I'm relating back to feeling a little lost when adopting new ways with horses or life. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's highly appropriate. I really like that story. All right, here, here we go. (laughs) So um, the way this begins is I was offered Um, the opportunity to relocate to an incredibly beautiful spot um, with a view of the ocean on a gentle hillside, two miles from a state park with cliffs and bluffs. And I'm all about ocean and, um, you know, step out the front door and breathe ocean air. And so when I was offered, you know, would you like to just come spend a night and see how you like it, see how it feels to you? I'm like, oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes, I will be there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I showed up to spend the night. We had dinner. It was lovely. And I went back to the the beautiful cottage and it has an outdoor shower. Beautiful hot hot water and, you know, contained, right? Um, So I hopped in the shower 
just, you know, just, you got to test out the water pressure and make sure everything's cool. Right. Um, it was just absolutely lovely. And, you know, the, it's all private and all, all this beautiful stuff. So the door was open and it just was heavenly. So I reached out, turned off the shower, reached out and grabbed my towel. And I thought, wow, I'm just going to enjoy the steam for a little bit. And I went to pull the door closed so I can um, and just be in the steam while I dry off. And I hear the door go click and the click, you know how sometimes a sound is so loud, you know, like something just happened. Uh, and why did I pay such close attention to that click? This is weird. And all of a sudden, boom, something is lit up in my body. And I'm like, uh-huh. I don't remember seeing a latch to open the door from the inside. Okay. So immediately, even in that millisecond, I had so many conversations with myself. <laughs> And the first thing was, all right, let's just relax. Let's just relax. Before my hand reached out to even see if I could find a latch. We're just going to relax right now. We're in a shower. It's warm. We're sheltered. Somebody knows I'm here. I'm not alone. All is well. That all happened in like 0 0.072 seconds. <laughs> So then I smiled and I'm like, holy adventure. This is funny. Okay. Now, having the perspective that this is funny um, ha basically is a, a blossoming from decades of cultivating friendship with myself. And I'll just say that. And, you know, not to say it would take other people decades, it took me decades to, to actually. Um, have that kind of friendship where I, I truly am not alone. I have so much of myself that, oh my God, this is funny. Did you notice what we just did? Oh my God, we just got locked in a bathroom. Oh my God. And, and the other house is so far away. Nobody's going to even hear me scream. Oh my God, this is funny. Okay. But this is the friendship I've cultivated with myself. So I smiled, but then I had to relax because the tension could have creeped up. Right. So I reach out and I feel for a, a lever, a switch. Nope, no switch to open the door from the inside. And then I'm like, holy smokes, that then I felt confusion. Confusion came over me with my hand on the, there was a little handle, but no switch. Cause like this place is so beautiful. It is so well built. How could they not have a latch to open the door from the inside? It was confusing, but I couldn't find a latch. So then I stopped looking for a latch and I stood still. I'm like, okay, okay, let's look. And then just started assessing. Let's look at what we've got. I have a towel. It's mostly dry. This is good. Cause it was about like 53 degrees outside, which I don't know for you guys is, I don't, 12? It's chilly. There, yeah. Yeah. It was chilly. Um, but there was still steam in the shower. So I'm just looking at what I've got and consciously relaxing, going, all right, I've got a towel. Um, if I'm here all night, I have drinking water because I have running water. I have heat if I need it because there's hot water. I can run the hot water and make more steam. I have shelter if it rains. And I'll be fine if I don't. And this is literally where my thinking went. If I'm here for four or five days, I can fast. That's okay. I've got water. I've got shelter. I've got a towel. And then I reached back again to see if there was a, a switch. Couldn't find one. So I just exhale and I said, all right, what can I do? What can I do? So <clears throat> I thought about time, right? Like, hmm. I might be in here for hours and hours and hours. So if nobody comes in all of that time, do I even need to think about time? Nope. The sun will let me know when it's morning. So I just let go of time. I didn't 
think about it. I didn't need to calculate it. I, the only relation I, I did to time was one of the games I played um, while I was in the shower was counting to 4,000. And I did that because it takes about an hour. So I figured I can count to 4,000 as many times as I, as I want to. Um, so that was one of the things I did. Um, and so I sat there, I moved my body. I did some Qigong, I meditated, sat down, um, meditated, got cold and just sort of played for a second with, is it okay if I'm cold? This is a good question. So this is when the real curiosity started, right? I'm, I'm cold. The body's cold. How, what kind of care will I take of my own body? It's a good question. It goes down to self-worth, right? And I started asking myself, what, what's really going on here? Why am I locked in a shower? Why am I locked in a shower where nobody can hear me? Why am I locked in a shower where I am completely at the mercy of somebody else walking by at some point ever? Why am I here? What's really going on? And who am I in this situation? So these are this is where I go with my curiosity. Because really, ultimately, I just want to know who and what I really am and what my genuine walk on this planet is about. How much can I be the love that I am, right? So I just asked those questions and then just meditated and started to notice what my body actually feels like. And it was cold. So I went through my heart into the whole universe and said, all right, I'm absolutely willing to know what I'm trying to get my own attention about here. Like, bring it on. I'm, I'm willing. Show me where I'm trying to get my own attention. Um, and then I <clears throat> rolled up my towel really small and tucked it up in a tiny slot to keep it as dry as I possibly could and turned on the hot water again to warm up. And then I'm like, oh, this is a bad idea because then there's going to be steam and it's going to get cold again. What if my towel is cold? <sighs> Relax. Conscious relaxation. And I was leaning on the wall thinking, why have I not tried kicking the door open? That was a good question. And the real answer was, well, I don't want to break the door. Oh, why? Why? Another really good question. The truth was, because I want her to like me. Because I don't, I, this is beautiful. And I would say yes to this situation. But if I break her door, she might say, I never want to see you again. And then everybody in the community is going to know. And then, and then, and then. So I had to get really honest with myself about <clears throat> um, what value I was placing on myself. And who I was giving the power to define my value, the value of my comfort, my wealth, or my, my health, my wealth, right? And my way of walking in the world. So all of this was sort of percolating <clears throat> um, when, the, you know, the steam built up in the little shower room kind of to an unbearable level. I'm like, holy smokes, I'm gonna suffocate myself in the steam. So now I had to turn off the hot water Wrap, wrap back up in my towel. And I thought, what's more valuable, a door or my freedom? What if she doesn't like me? Can I be okay with that? And so I went through these kinds of explorations and truly came to the point where, you know, I bet you I could put some pressure on that door just to see maybe the screws will pull out. You know, maybe I can break the door in the gentlest way possible. <laughs> and so I, I did that. I put my back against the other wall and put my leg up and started putting pressure on the door and it wasn't moving. And I'm like, wow, this is a really well-built room. But I had already set in motion that exploration of where am I assigning value? Am I less valuable than a door? And once I realized that that was the, the real crux of it, 
is who am I giving away my power to, to define how valuable I am, what I'm worth. When I realized that that was really the crux of this situation, I relaxed. Mm -hmm. And I started exploring like how grateful I am to be in this situation and not in a prisoner of war situation where I'm submerged in murky swamp water in a cage with only enough space for my face to be above the water and breathe like a prisoner of war situation. And um, so I started looking at situations like that and just being really, really grateful that my big problem in the world is the option to break a door. Yeah. And so along those lines of, of thinking and exploration, I just was putting more consistent pressure, like, and I, I know I've experienced myself with kind of superhuman strength in other times when I've needed it in, in my life. And it, this wasn't one of those, but I just know this pretty strong body. So I just kept pressure, 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 pressure. And it was literally, sim literally simultaneous that the thought and the, the recognition and the knowing came to me that I'm not willing to be a prisoner anymore. Boom, the door popped open. Mm. Nothing broke. The latch simply gave and the door swung wide open. And the first thing I did was relax and go, okay, the door is open. I'm going to go to sleep now. I'm going to go in there and I am going to receive this gift of a very comfortable bed in a warm house and I'm going to go to sleep. And that, that was what I did. And it turned out I was in the shower uh, for nearly five hours because I looked at the clock when I in the, went in the shower and then when I got out again. Right. So um, for the next, literally for the next two days, going through that, reclaiming myself from being a prisoner of other people's valuations and getting that clarity, mm -hmm. it reorganized my relationship with myself. I was in an altered state for about two days, feeling very different in my own body and navigating um, just day-to-day -day tasks just from knowing that I'm only willing to walk toward my heart. Only love is welcome here. So I don't know what's going to happen after this. I don't know who I am. I don't know how anything's going to go. All I know is I'm available for love and nothing less. And, um, and so that kind of a process is not managed by the mayor of Thinky Town. That process is managed entirely by the beingness of my heart and who I truly am. So, you know, when my, my, prayer, if you will, my orientation is show me the love that I can be here on the planet. That's, that's how I've been walking through it is regardless of what comes, then I I'm available for love and nothing less. So show me what that looks like. And then I do what I can with what I have. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, you just address what what's right in front of you rather than get lost in the annals of thinky town saying what else I could have done if I, if it were different than it is, it's not different than it is. This is what it is. So I'm going to address what's immediately in front of me to the best of my ability from curiosity and open heartedness, whether it's a human or a horse or a competition or a team that I need to work with or a parent or a memory. Mm -hmm. I can bring the same quality of beingness to all of those and be communicating to the whole universe. I'm available for love and nothing less. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I think that it will trickle through our consciousnesses, our consciousness. And it, there's so many ways we can apply how you handle that to our lives. I always kind of say, you, I want to help people find joy in their shit storms, you know, in the middle of a <laughs> 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 Maybe 
maybe elicits the, it's, it's something that's maybe a little unrealistic but that is finding your center in the middle of what you could have let it grow to be like oh my god I'm trapped I was trapped in there for hours you could have told a completely different story of how you were trapped for five hours <laughs> totally um and I think that the process that you use of softening and having curiosity um will allow us to navigate whatever's in front of us so I heard a lot of themes soften so we're taking a moment when we soften too to get in touch with our felt experience mm -hmm. have no judgment just curiosity and or uh, if you do have judgment just call it out okay don't don't punish it just go look at me judging and I wonder how long I want to wear that T-shirt when there's another option available. Yeah, so I I started noticing that I was judging people and that then you also judge yourself, right? So it's just an awful double-edged sword. And um, to get out of it, I would, um, I did have an elastic and I just, uh. <laughs> so I would sort of, that didn't work. I call myself Judgy McJudgy <laughs> Pants and that, I thought it was funny. And so Judgy yeah. McJudgy Pants. And the mayor's yes. key town kind of go hand in hand. I think. <laughs> totally. Maybe that's the mascot, you know, <laughs> a thinky town is judgy McJudgy pants. Yeah. Yeah. And then having a sense of humor about it all. I Completely. Think. Yeah. Yes. yes. There's there, the, there was a wisdom given to me um, that really everything is funny. Everything is funny. And if you don't think it's funny, take a step back and look again. Mm -hmm. And if it's still not funny, take another step back and look again. Yeah. And just keep keep expanding until you go, oh, <laughs> that's funny. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. This, you know, I had to go to a very, very broad place and visit death to remind myself how seriously I take myself and how funny it is that I take and all of humanity, we take ourselves so seriously, mm -hmm. but you know, it's going to happen. So when it happens, just remember, like, it's all right. Just mm -hmm. notice it. It's okay. Of course, of course, because the judgments can be our best friend from time to time to keep us awake, to keep us alive, to keep us moving. Right. This is why Let's let's not make judgy McJudgy pants like you know Gollum and banish yeah. you know that make it the ugliest thing in the world like whatever. Yes, there's judgment and there will be judgment again. The question is, what would I like to contribute to what's immediately in front of me? Mm -hmm. And if, if that is your meditation, then you are on a fast track. If you are constantly curious who I am or just this idea of I am you are on the fast track right it just there's different levels of complexity different levels of simplicity and really the entire universe encourages us just be where you are start where you are have some popcorn have a croissant enjoy your day but notice what's actually happening and it's all going to work itself out yes yes <laughs> and our yoga balls we bounce on our yoga balls <laughs> perfect well thank you so much um i uh really enjoyed meeting you and talking to you and sharing ideas and um just spreading this as much as i can as much as any of us can um and i feel really lucky really privileged that i get to stop in the middle of my day and get on a zoom call with Carrie Lake. And <laughs> well, thank you. It's an honor to me every time these conversations happen as well, you know, as the saying goes, uh, where two or more gather, there is God. Right. And mm -hmm. I don't know who said that it's written somewhere. I'm pretty sure, but I like it. Mm -hmm. So I share it because it, we amplify each other, you know, and um, when we amplify each other from a pure and open heart, that's what gets amplified and it's wonderful.
It's really wonderful. So thank you for everything it takes to produce a podcast page and your, your own willingness to be seen and to share and be open and honest. I appreciate it. And it's, it's such an honor to me to get to be here and play with you too. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to uh, more in the future and uh, thank you and sign off for today. Take a chance. Thanks, Jessica and Vanessa and Tim was here and Carla was here for a little while too. So thanks to everybody. Thank you. Hey, you're still here. Thanks so much for listening. What you think and feel matters. If this resonated with you, please like and share. It truly makes a difference. I encourage you to engage with the content on my Substack account and my socials, all at The Magic of Horsecraft, where you can join the discussion and shape the future shows. Tell me what you want to hear more of or less of, and we'll evolve together as we grow a community of like-minded souls here for the good of the horse. If you're an adult amateur horse lover looking for confidence and clarity in your role of equine steward, check out my course, From Amateur to Magician, Making Magic with Horses at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, I'm here to remind you of a couple of things. One, underneath it all, we all want the same things, to be heard, understood, and accepted for who we are. And two, anything is possible. Take a chance. <laughs>